Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical. Thank you for stopping by. Um, <clears throat> my weekend article was called The End Is Nigh, and yesterday it certainly felt as if it was. There were quite some apocalyptic scenes. This is uh, from Caco Minor. Uh, this was a dust uh, cloud that cr came across Arusha and then apparently visited us here in Nairobi and the environs and then we had a blackout so from about 6 p.m. till early in the morning uh, the lights were off um, and hence I thought the end is now played rather well into that story. Macro thoughts US factory gauge hit a 10-year low uh, this is from Holger I take you back again to the end of December last year. I said, if the US economy slows, I can guarantee you the rest of the world will slow further. That remains the important and overarching point. And furthermore, the US economy is not a manufacturing economy. Of course, Trump has made much of this, but it isn't. It's a services and consumer-based economy uh, predominantly. And therefore, you know, this big wobble that we saw uh, once that data came out, is not is being misinterpreted to some degree. Too much weight has been given to that sector. Uh, Trump, of course, tweeted, as I predicted, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve have allowed the dollar to get so strong, especially relative to all other currencies, that our manufacturers are being negatively affected. Fed rate too high, they are their own worst enemies, they don't have a clue. Pathetic. Um, Trump, as I said on the 5th of August, keeps talking about weakening the dollar, and I find it curious that such a stable genius is yet to calculate that a strong dollar is infinitely better. Um, and if he is serious about his warfare strategy, he needs to add currency warfare to his tariff sanction and linguistic warfare arsenal. My perspective about the dollar is this, and it's just a fraction of its 2019 high. There is very little President can, Trump can do about it. In fact, the risk is that when the market sees he's powerless, the dollar is going to lift off like the proverbial parabola. Dollar index, this is a 12-hour chart from FX, PIP, Titan, no changes, the multi-year bull trend remains intact, and I agree with that. Uh, as I said at the end of December last year, uh, the direction of the dollar is pivotal. I am increasingly in a minority, but I expect the dollar to strengthen about 10% through 2019, and that folks are keenly looking for chinks in the U.S. economy. U.S. 10-year Treasury yield drops 10 basis points after the ISM manufacturing miss. Uh, it fell to 47.8. Home Thoughts, Asif Kapadia, and I'm going to tell you about the first film, which was his first film, which I watched, and still remains my favourite. It's called The Warrior. I'll come to it in a moment, but he's become tremendously successful. And he's just released a documentary about Diego Maradona. And The Guardian, in a review, says the documentary slices through the myth to show us the man. Diego Armando Maradona's life is a cliché, a rags-to-riches tragedy. He started as a poor boy with no filter, one whose ruthless drive and innate skill took him to greatness before a sudden fall. Had he been watching, Andy Warhol would have been enthralled. In the film titled Maradona, Capadia slices through the persisting myth of D10S, attempting to free Diego the man from Maradona the legend. And this gentleman who's reviewing the documentary, as a kid I looked past his drug addiction and involvement with the mafia. Now, the reality of Maradona's past, which Carpadia skillfully peels back, is undeniable. Maradona's present raises even more worrying questions. Giselle Fernandez, the current vice presidential candidate for Argentina's opposition party Frente para Todos, 
and sister of former President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner gifted Maradona a rosary-carrying locket. Inside was a picture of her mother. Maradona is an avowed Kirchnerist and Fernandez is an ardent Gymnasia supporter. It's unclear how much business the Fernandez family have tied up in the club, if any, but Noticias, an Argentinian weekly magazine, reported the club expects to make $3 million from sponsorship this season. Capadia shows us a frightened Maradona, a man who allowed his legend to consume his life, ultimately destroying him. As time passes, Maradona's myth will continue to change. The only certainty is that the image we have of Maradona is the same as that of Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, or any other subject of Warhol, Warhol's diptiches, a fiction. We can take the lessons we want, or we need them. This is a photograph David Yarrow, who's a wonderful wildlife photographer, took 33 years ago of Diego Maradona at the World Cup Finals, and that day, David says, remains fresh in his memory. Um, and this is Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe diptych um, when it was sold at Christie's. And of course, I used Warhol in my article, The End Is Nigh, speaking about Unger and the fact that everybody gets 15 minutes at Unger, and using his quote that in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. <clears throat> my favorite Asif Kapadia movie is The Warrior, a 2001 film starring Irfan Khan as Lafkadia, a warrior in feudal Rajasthan, who attempts to give up the sword. It's just an extraordinary film. I found half of it on YouTube and was watching it last night. It really is terrific. And watch it if you can. Nicholas Romelt captured the photos for this digitally combined view from Mount Shergant in the Alps at the peak of the 2018 Perseids meteor shower with Tyrodian peak stars nebulas band of the Milky Way galaxy in the shooting Perseid. Political reflections, Boris Johnson, in a res response to uh, a clip that was showing when he was trying to take in his, his coffee cup, disposable coffee cup, and it was taken off him rather aggressively. And he says, I got my coffee in the end. 5th of August, I was writing about him, uh, specifically using the quote, what's your road, man? And I said, the key question is this, can 10 Downing Street, can Boris Johnson self-eject Britain? I think he can. Can he be stopped, I asked. It does not look like it. And I said, this is a political calculation. Um, there were rumours that the EU was uh, getting a bit more relaxed about the backstop, but then they denied it. But clearly, he's had some movement. <clears throat> this is a sterling one-hour chart from FX Pip Titan. We are currently at 122.76. We had a huge rally yesterday on that EU news that was then subsequently denied. But here we are. I, for one, still think we're headed below 120, in part because of the stronger dollar story and the uncertainty around Brexit. But the more I think about Brexit, there is no hard Brexit. Because the day you leave the European Union, you'll have to re-enter into negotiations with them because they are the biggest single customer of the United Kingdom. Uh, FX Pip Titan, he sees a reversal in the short-term trend, provided it holds into this Friday's NFP report. He's looking for 123.35 and 123.91. We're currently at 122.76. Now going back to China, Xi Jinping is seen waving to Xi Jinping, and Xi Jinping is waving back in this little bit of footage. It's rather good. As I wrote on the 27th of May, he's the president for life. He's on a pedestal. There is only one decider in China, and that decider is Xi, and that was decided on March 2018 when he was made president for life. Foreign policy, Xi Jinping is the life and soul of the party. Um, much like the prince in the classic Sicilian novel, Leopard, one of my favorite novels, if you haven't read it, read it, Giuseppe de Lampedusa. 
who says the only way to maintain his family's power is to upend the existing power structures. Everything needs to change, the prince says in the book's most famous line, so everything can stay the same. China has built massive new islands in the South China Sea, flexed naval muscle by challenging any foreign ships which sail nearby, unilaterally declared a new Chinese air defense zone near Japan and South Korea. By 2012, the WTO had proved a good bet for China with the economy exploding from 1.4 trillion in 2002 to 8.5 trillion. That economic strength was immediately translated into bigger defense spending. Between 2002 and 2012, China's official annual military budget increased fivefold from 22 billion to around 110 billion. Um, some of the Z era slogans are short and simple, such as the Chinese dream, um, saying in a way there is also nothing new. Xi has taken the propagation of ideology and cult of personality to extremes not seen since the days of Chairman Mao. But in Hong Kong, when the economy unravels or at least hope of a better life disappears, the ideology that had been marketed as underpinning prosperity starts to look threadbare as well. 27th of May, I spoke about the Chinese-US war turning ballistic, and on that note, Hu Ziyin, who I follow on social media, this is the legendary DF-41 ICBM. It is not a tale. Today it is displayed at Tiananmen Square. I touched one about four years ago in the production plant. No need to fear it, just respect it respect China that owns it, he says. In this footage, which is flashed around the world, women militia soldiers parade on the 70th anniversary of communist China. It's rather fancy, I must say. 9th of July, I asked tariff wars, who blinks first? This is uh, the diptych of Chairman Mao by Andy Warhol. And of course, uh, Wong, Joshua Wong, who's one of the leaders of the leaderless revolution in Hong Kong, uh, said, Hong Kong ist das neue Berlin. Hong Kong is the new Berlin. Of course, more famously, John F. Kennedy said that on June 26, 1963, in West Berlin, ich bin ein Berliner. And then Joshua is tweeting, on China's National Day, Hong Kong has fallen into a de facto police state. No official has spoken publicly yet. The paramilitary security forces completely took over the city. 19th of August this year, I said the periphery is a tinderbox in many parts of the world. I referenced Xinjiang. I said it's under lockdown and a 21st century experiment is what I called it. Same time, I was saying it's not possible, in my opinion, to Xinjiang, Hong Kong. Um, however, I might have to be disavowed of that notion. But the frontier from Xinjiang to Kashmir, from Gaza to Crimea, from Hong Kong to Taiwan are the 21st century flashpoints. Giuliani's totally unhinged performance shows how hard it will be for him or anyone else to defend Trump against allegation, uh, allegations that could, in theory, be proven with documents released publicly by his own White House. The irony for Trump is if he, if he uh, falls, he will be the author of his own demise. And it's practically Shakespeare. And I was thinking to myself this morning, which Shakespeare play best exemplifies this situation? And Hervé told me it's Macbeth. I take you back to the 31st of December. He's trapped. He's playing poker, holding two threes, and suddenly putting all of his chips in. It's pure emotion, the mark of a panicking amateur. Moving on, apparently Emmanuel Macron paid Hassan Rouhani an unannounced visit during UNGA, had technicians set up a secure line with Trump in a meeting room on the Iranian president's floor. Rouhani refused the call with Trump. 
at the Millennium Hilton Hotel near the UN headquarters in New York. Rouhani refused to emerge from his room, leaving Macron and Trump hanging, the outlet reported. Macron's failed efforts followed Trump's UN speech in which he said Tehran had bloodlust and directly blamed Iran for a recent attack on a Saudi Arabian oil plant. Um, I wrote about this on the 30th of September. I said Rouhani skipped a handshake with Trump and instead delivered his message direct via Fox News, which was a very neat touch in my humble opinion. The Iranians, according to the Robert Fisk, may have concluded that Trump, in the immortal words of American colonist Nicholas Kristof, is the mother of all bunny rabbits. But it seems pretty clear that Trump's decision to tear up U.S. commitments under the Iranian nuclear deal is a colossal disaster, indeed it is. Chief of Staff of Iran's Armed Forces, the IRGC, is providing Yemen's Houthis with advisory help, said the IRGC spokesman. And this is an interesting point. They're no longer looking to be non-linear about the connection. They're seeking to take credit for what has been an extraordinary asymmetric response, frankly. 16th of September, I wrote about drone strikes deep inside the kingdom, and I said the overwhelming geopolitical question is around the longevity of the House of Saud and its crown prince, who is, of course, the proud owner of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which means saviour of the world. And according to Robert Baer, has so many enemies that he sleeps on his $500 million yacht, the Serene of Jeddah. And I concluded by saying the much commented on orb is of no help now. On the 30th of September, I also wrote, no number of Patriot missile batteries can protect the House of Saud and its Salvatore Mundi now. The enemy is no longer at the border, although they're there as well. It's on the inside. And that's why I remain bullish oil. And I think this opportunity of uh, price weakness is a time to buy it. 13th of May, I said, if the US thinks that Tehran will just roll over, which appears to be the case, then they're exhibiting the same deluded ideas they exhibited a day before the Peacock throne got plucked, which similarly blindsided them. Look at this photograph, Kamenei, Hassan Nasrallah, and Qasem Soleimani. Uh, and this uh, photograph has been issued by the Supreme Leader. And this goes to my point that they're no longer hiding below the radar. They want, they want to show the Saudis that, look, we have delivered you this response. And it's the three of us. <laughs> it's quite amazing. They're leading the counterattack and popping their heads above the radar. Of course, as I wrote in May 2019, the level of financial and coercive sanction warfare that Trump has placed on Iran is simply unprecedented, and he's left them with no room. So that's why you're seeing these uh, responses finely calibrated, but, you know, sending a very clear message. 17th of June, I was quoting Stratford, who said the overwhelming confidence that Iran is displaying, both in rhetoric and action, are astounding. The national interest, Saudi Arabia under siege, is the kingdom quietly crumbling. Something is rotten in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Prince Mohammed bin Salman, also known as MBS, was once the promising young face of the Arab monarchy. Now he's racking up foreign policy defeats abroad and facing disturbing murmurs at home. Houthi rebels took down a Saudi mechanized column along the border. Um, talking about ramping up, uh, escalating the situation with Iran, the blockade of Qatar, um, the fact that on Sunday a royal bodyguard was shot and killed in Jeddah, um, a $7.3 billion train station in Jeddah suddenly burst into flames on Sunday afternoon, speculation about an internal job by anti-MBS elements. One thing is for sure, MBS will not be able to count on a bailout from the United States if his Hail Mary fails. 
And that's why, as I said on the 23rd of September, and one of the reasons I'm so bullish about oil is I think we're at this peacock throne moment for the House of Saud. Um, the Shah of Shah has ended up in Panama all on his lonesome looking out to sea and there is another fellow not unlike the fictional Dean Jocelyn of the Spire with a $500 million yacht called the Serene who will most likely be looking out to sea in the not too distant future. Agnes Kalamad talking about the murder of the journalist Khashoggi in Turkey, the operation could not have been implemented with such flagrant confidence, resourcing, and then to this day, impunity without state sanction at the highest level. And then uh, I was looking at the responses that were coming to her tweets and, you know, the quality of the defensive game on behalf of the Crown Prince is so poor, it's weird. As an example, Kingdom has taken necessary measures after the incident. They include a regulatory process of restructuring the General Intelligence Presidency as well as relieving from their positions a number of officials. Classic example. Saudi coalition launches major offensive along the Yemeni border, says the Arab source. And as I said on the 13th of November 2017, the then 30-year-old Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, MBS, arrived on the scene and immediately launched an unwinnable war in the Yemen. It's not winnable. He said, it will be a cakewalk. Over in a week, he said, they'll be throwing rose petals at our feet. It's now clear that the Yemen war has become Saudi Arabia's Vietnam. And indeed, the end is nigh. In my article over the weekend, I was bullish the dollar. That was, of course, before we had that weak number yesterday, but I remain bullish the dollar. I think we're going a lot, lot higher. The dollar, I said, has been girding its loins all year and is set to explode by the dollar. The number on Friday is probably going to be weak, and that's another buying opportunity, frankly. President Z will have to let the renminbi go, so sell the renminbi, in my opinion. Uh, let me take a look at where we are, 7.1528. Um, the CCP, of course, is celebrating 70 years of the People's Republic, but when the party is over, it will be an almighty hangover. Um, I was also talking about the feedback loop phenomenon, and I said the most important currency to watch is the renminbi. I'm also advocating you sell sterling, because I think the United Kingdom, for all the talk in Georgia, is going to crash out of, the, out of Europe, and the euro as well, because I think parity is calling. Look at the Eurozone manufacturing data. This is from D. Lankal. Let's move on to currency markets. The Euro is at 109.17, dollar index at 99.255, Japanese yen 107.65, Swiss franc 0.9934, the pound 122.70, the Australian dollar, which had a very poor session after the rate cut yesterday, at 6,700. India would be 71.1085, South Korean 112.03, Brazilian Real 14.1599, Egyptian pound 16.3, and the Rand heading towards that 1550 level, which is very key, 15.3280. This is a chart of the euro dollar, as I've said before, I'm bearish. The consensual hallucination here continues. This is a distressed asset in free fall that is inarguably worth less than zero. Because all we have here is an entity burning $700 million a quarter. Guess, this is Professor Galloway in the New York Magazine talking about WeWork. It's mind-boggling. As long as the charade continues, they were willing to go along with it. You're right, his hard partying and yoga babble were seen as features, not bugs, until the market threw up on it. He has 15,000 people right now who are stuck cleaning up. They feel like circus clowns shoveling the shit behind the elephant of Adam Neumann. He has taken $750 million dollars and left a toxic waste cleanup. If you tell a 30-year-old male he's Jesus Christ, he's inclined to believe you. The bigger story here is SoftBank. WeWork is the opportunistic infection that is going to kill the Vision One fund. It's beyond repair. 
In terms of human toll, this is where the real damage starts. This has been a really interesting and romantic story about the fall of Adam Neumann and SoftBank. They've got it wrong. Adam Neumann came in, smoked his own supply and walked out with three quarters of a billion dollars about the time that people in hazmat suits showed up. It's like the guy at Chernobyl who refused to believe what was going on was given three quarters of a billion dollars to leave before the shit got real. The notion that Adam Neumann was fired, my God, he got on the last helicopter out of Saigon. Commodity markets, on the weekend I said safe havens like gold were trading like everybody is long and very crowded and looks set to deteriorate. We had a bit of a recovery yesterday, we're back to 1481. Look, if we get back to 1500, that's the place to sell it. Where is Bitcoin? Bitcoin at 8200. I think they're both going lower, but you could get a little bit of a bounce near term. Gold, uh, as I said, 1482, and uh, I think one has to sell rebounds here. Crude oil, um, still under pressure, not getting a, a serious upside traction, but I expect that to happen. Uh, currently at $53.90. RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, would like to assure the general public that the Indian banking system is safe and stable. There is no need to panic on the basis of such rumours. There are rumours in some locations about certain banks, including cooperative banks, resulting in anxiety among the depositors. When the central bank puts out a message like that, I found in my experience that's exactly the time to panic. Have a look at this. India's Yes Bank is now down 50% in 10 days, having slumped before that 10-day uh, picture. That's from Birdie Word. Zimbabwe's president, Ed Manangagwa, pleads for patience in bringing the economy back from the dead. As his government faces blame for surging inflation, evoking dark days under Mugabe, hopes that the economy will quickly rebound under Manangagwa, who took over after Mugabe was deposed in a coup in November 2017, have faded fast. With Zimbabweans grappling with acute shortages of fuel, electricity and soaring prices, I am aware of the pain being experienced by the poor and the marginalised. Getting the economy working again from being dead will require patience, time, unity of purpose and perseverance, he said. Um, we've spoken about this severally. I wrote about it on the 9th of September on the passing away of Robert Mugabe and I said Emerson Manangagwa, who was eulogising Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. Uh, we are grateful to all those iconic leaders who liberated our continent, of which Mugabe is one, but at what price? Fighting for independence is not the same as building an economy which provides opportunity for all its citizens. And then 5th of August, we are sitting in a vehicle whose wheels have fallen off, said Derek Matsiak, a senior researcher at a South African think tank, the Institute of Security Studies about Zimbabwe. 21st of January, I said, what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. Nothing has changed my mind. The US government has made a decision to seize diamonds from Zimbabwe and declare them the product of forced labour. It's controversial, but it's the culmination of a Western lobby to widen the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme's definition of conflict diamonds. This was a major source of revenue. This might well be the straw that breaks the camel's back. The economy is set for its first contraction since 2008 and has an inflation rate that's estimated at more than 900% by some analysts. Now they've issued a mobile money directive which might halt commerce entirely. So it's a very tricky situation. It's getting closer and closer to the tipping point, which I said was around in January. Reports of military attacks abuses down in Bodhi, South Omo in recent days are increasingly alarming. This is Tom Gardner. Some hundred men, women and children have been killed according to estimates. Reports of bodies, women and men thrown in the river. Ethiopia, he, the Prime Minister, terrific man, Mandela marked version 2, but you've got these forces which are pulling Ethiopia apart, and whether you can hold it together is not clear at all to me. 
South Africa's seasonally adjusted ABSA Purchasing Managers Index sank to its lowest level in a decade in September. This goes back to the China emerging market frontier feedback loop phenomenon. That phenomenon was positive for the last two decades, but has now undergone a trend reversal, and uh, South Africa is at the bleeding edge of that trend reversal. South African oil shares up 4.19% year-to-date dollar rand at 15.327, heading towards 15.5 in my opinion. Egyptian pound 16.2950, EGX 30, well it got down to nearly flat for the year. It's now back to up 11.21% year-to-date. Nigerian oil share down 12.09%, Ghana stock exchange down 11.9% year-to-date. Uh, the NSSF here in Kenya is uh, communicating on the allegations that 5.6 billion shillings is currently missing. The interbank rate at which banks borrow from each other on an emergency basis hit an average of 7.45% last week, with smaller banks accessing funds as high as 10%. The central bank has been draining liquidity via repo operations at 8.98%, and that's where everything's been going. Uh, Nairobi all shares up 3.89% year to date. NSE 20 is down 13.87% year to date. Uh, these were photographs of the dust storm yesterday, which changed the sky over our place in Embu into a strange hue of red and orange. It was beautiful, but very odd. It says cave mountainous. That took me back to something I wrote about the, in the 1st of April. There is certainly a fin de siècle, even an apocalyptic mood afoot. And then I was saying the conundrum for those who wish to bet on the end of the world is this. However, what would be the point the world would have ended? Thank you for listening.